for a free study cap trial account with instant access to award-winning games and activities to engage young learners of English at studycat.com slash schools. Uh, you can see the link in um, the chat box. <clears throat> Our next speaker uh, giving a 30 minute talk is Heidi Harvan grosch Heidi has been working with children of all ages in a variety of educational settings, uh, both indoors and outside for almost 40 years. She currently works in the teacher education program at Nord University, uh, University in Norway. You can follow her on her YouTube channel, Cyberbridge. During Heidi's session, we recommend watching in speaker view. And if you have any questions, please type them in the Q and A box, uh, not the chat box. Over to you. Please share your, uh, your screen, Heidi, when you're ready. I am ready. Thank okay. you very much. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Heidi Grosch, and I'm coming to you from a Christmas tree farm in the middle of Norway. Today, we're going to be talking about empowering teachers and primary learners with nature. And many of the things that we've heard in the last two days about uh, children and young learners focusing their attention when they're at play and the need for active engagement comes into play when we are looking at the outdoors as a teacher for us. So children, young learners learn when they are active, when they are involved, when they can use their whole bodies. They are active in their learning when they have the opportunity to choose what they will do, to be investigators, to make learning something that is their interest. When learners are engaged, they are also active in the learning process, and that is an empowering feeling for them. All of these things can happen when we allow nature to be our teacher and when we take learning outdoors because Nature is all around us, if only we stop and see. Nature is all around us, a teacher for you and me. To be out in nature, however, we have to do one simple thing. We have to get up out of your chair, get away from your screen, get outside, move around and let the ideas stream. One way we can do that is by going out and looking at the sky. Nature gives us a common sky and colors to paint it with. No matter where we are in the world, whether we live in the city or the country, the sky is an umbrella that covers with all. It covers us all. So why not use that as a tool for our language learning? When you ask a young learner, what color is the sky? Often they might say, it's blue. But really, when you look at the sky, it's so many different colors. Imagine if you became investigators and you went outside and looked at the sky at various times of the year, and then you ask the, your young learners to color the sky. Can we have purple? Can we have blue? Can we have white? Suddenly you're learning all the colors of the rainbow. You can also think of the sky as shapes. Clouds are different shapes and how many of us have gone outside and looked at the clouds and tried to say, there's a dragon or there's a dog. Well, do that with your young learners and then create a story with those clouds, create a story with those shapes that you see. Sky journeys are also interesting. You may know the story of Aladdin who had a magic carpet, but what if your children, your young learners, had magic clouds that they could fly upon? Where would they go? You also may know the story of Jack and the Beanstalk, who planted a beanstalk that went up into the clouds to the place where the giants lived. Go outside with your young learners and speculate who might live up in the clouds. What sort of place might that be? I'm referring you to a picture book called Look Up. And this is about a young girl who dreams of what the sky holds and believes that one day she is going to be the greatest astronaut, star catcher, and space traveler that has ever lived. It takes a meteor shower and her enthusiasm and persistence to get her brother to look up from his cell phone and notice the sky. So take a look at this book. 
it's really a wonderful resource for you and your young learners. There's also a great organization called the International Dark Sky Association that's full of wonderful resources for you. At the end of this chat, I'm going to give you all of these links. Nature can also help us listen and see. And so often we're so busy going through life that we don't really listen. So take your learners outside and spend a few minutes quietly listening to the world around, listening to your neighborhoods, whether you're in the city or the country, and suddenly you start to notice all kinds of different things around you. Nature also helps us see. If you look at this image I'm sharing with you, it's the shadows, and shadows are everywhere. If you are an investigator with your young learners, go out at different times of day. Where are the shadows and what story might those shadows tell? This image, for example, where is that shadow staircase going? What shape do I see? How many rectangles are in these shadows? And do you see the triangle? Suddenly you can utilize shadows to also tie into other cross-curricular topics, mathematics, for example. So what stories and what forms do you see in the shadows? This picture book, Daniel Finds a Poem, is a wonderful book to find poetry in nature and to help us listen and see. Daniel goes into a park and he wonders, what is poetry? And the creatures in the park and the trees in the park tell him through the use of metaphor, painting images with words. On Tuesday, Daniel climbs the old oak tree. He sees squirrel. Squirrel, do you know what poetry is? Poetry is when crisp leaves crunch, squirrel tells him. So this book is a great way to use as a model text for going and playing with language and all the things that you see out in nature. Nature is all around us, if only we stop and look. Nature is all around us, hiding in every nook. Nature is all around us, just listen and you'll hear. Nature is all around us in sounds both far and near. Nature also helps us explore poetry, stories, and words. Um, if you Google read, write, think, and I'll provide you with the link, but you can also Google it yourselves. Read, write, think. It's a wonderful resource with full of finished lesson plans for all ages. And if you write poetry walk in the search box, you get a full lesson plan on how you can go outside and play with sensory images. How do you use your different senses to create poetry? And they also give you um, model texts like diamante and acrostic and haiku, places where you can just fill in the recipe so that your, your young learners can feel that pride in writing a piece of poetry themselves. Story walks are also very popular in libraries today. And if you Google story walk or libraries who have story walks, you can find a lot of ideas. You can take a book, if you have a picture book that's falling apart, you can take it and laminate it or put it into a plastic sleeve and spread it out along a path, put it in your neighborhood if you live in a city, put it in a forest if you're in the country, and then your young learners have to read the story as they go through this path or in, on, in out in nature. You can also do this with fairy tales, for example, you could have your young learners color a picture of Little Red Riding Hood, for example, um, a picture of her talking to her mother, a picture of her out in the forest meeting the wolf, a picture of the wolf meeting the grandmother. And then you put these pictures on the path or in different places in your community or your neighborhood. And then the children have to try and find the right order of the story, physically moving again and being active in the storytelling. Another thing that you can do is have a few of your young learners go out and find out where the story is. Where are, where's the first part? Where's the second part? Where's the third part? And then they become guides for the rest of their class. Come, let me take you on a story walk. And then they are using their um, own passion to tell this story. 
You could even do that with stories that you create. But the idea is you get outside, you move through the story, and suddenly the story becomes a part of you. The two images that I have here, um, in Norway, we often have creatures or characters that are carved into old wooden stumps. And they help us tell that story too. So you as a teacher could go and hide figures or stuffed animals in your playground, in your neighborhood, and the children find them. And when they come across something that is not supposed to be there, they have to tell the story about how it got there. Another thing that you can do is time for another song, is you can have your children find objects in nature in your city neighborhood or your rural neighborhood that help them tell the stories. And this is another little song that you can use. And all of the songs that I'm singing today, I've written. So help yourselves, Varshagu, we should, we'll say in Norwegian. Um, they hold the object and they sing. We all sing together. What do you have? What do you have? What do you have in your hand? What do you have? What do you have? What do you have in your hand? And then the child says, I have a stone. And the other children say, you have a stone. And together we sing, you have a stone in your hand. And the, the young learner says, I have a stone. And we all sing, you have a stone. You have a stone in your hand. And if you have older learners, you can actually uh, make this a little bit more complicated, add some adjectives. What do you have? What do you have? What do you have in your hand? What do you have? What do you have? What do you have in your hand? I have a stone that is gray and round. You have a stone in your hand. I have a stick that is long and sharp. You have a stick in your hand. As we know with young learners, repetition and song are one song are wonderful tools for them to absorb that language and make it a part of them. So why not use this in their vocabulary building as well? Writing. Nature gives us a new, new ways to read and to write. And we can write on any surface. And when you write with chalk, it washes away so you're not destroying any surface. Here is an example of writing on the sidewalk. You can write on a um, stone wall. You can write on the parking place, wherever you find it. And again, it washes away. What I have done with young learners is I have them go out and find objects that are different colors red or blue or green and then they come and they put them into a pile and they write the name of that thing that they have found here you see we have found red objects like a maple leaf an apple if you're going to use this with older learners then they can use simile using like or as or metaphor or write just a little sentence using the color so on the picture you see red is my heart Red is the color of my blood. So they're, they're extending the language a little bit more. If you look at the picture on the bottom, you can also send your young learners out. And this is good if you're in having to teach online and they have access to a telephone with a, a camera on it. You can have them go out and find different letters of the alphabet in nature. And here you see we have things that you might find in the city. We also have things that you find in the country. And I've actually done this with adults and they have had a wonderful time with it. But with children, it's a fun way to start to, again, see that letters and language are all around us. If you're looking for some more resources, you can Google land art and find some great ideas there. Another thing that you can do is you can make, have your students be investigators, be museum curators. So you can send them out again into nature, whether you're in the country or in the city, it doesn't matter where, and find different objects. Um, I did this with some students and they brought in some trash that they had found in the street, but that's still something that we find in nature. And again, opens up for conversations about how we live in nature and how we as humans interact with it. But you can send them out into nature to find different things that they're interested in. And then when you bring them back, 
they have to figure out what categories they put these things in. Are they organizing them by shape? Are they organizing them by the place they find them? They're from the trees, they're from the ground. Are they organizing them in natural versus man-made? Are they organizing them in color? So that is a way, again, we're creating a cross-curricular learning activity with our English language students and it's interdisciplinary. Then if you want to take this further, you can see here in the images, they've written the different categories on the blackboard, but you can also have them make little uh, signs where they uh, have the categories. Maybe they invite another class in and they become museum guides to show them around what they've been doing. You can also have them interview each other. Hi, I'm from the local TV show and I'm here at this museum exhibit to talk to and that becomes kind of fun because it brings in that idea of role play. And all of these things that I've talked to you about today are initiated by the learners themselves and they become very engaged in the process. A picture book that works really well here is called First the Egg by Roaring Book Brook Press. Um, this takes things from the beginning stage to the end. First the egg, then the chicken, first the caterpillar, then the butterfly. So you can again use this picture book as a model text. And when we think about nature, of course, it's natural to think about nature as a place where we can plant things. Um, we, you can have your young learners go outside and be weather reporters. Uh, they can think about how observing, again, things in nature, trees, plants, even in a city, things grow in the strangest of places. And what if they find things on their way to school and they become reporters? Guess what I saw today on my way to school? And you could even have your, uh, like a, a reporter wall where all of the unusual places that things grow, you can make a list of those. And again, it becomes a natural way to increase your vocabulary and to have your young learners engaged in the process. You can also have your young learners be seed scientists because everything that grows in nature, plants have seeds and we can save those seeds. So maybe they're walking along and they find a seed on the ground, they collect it, they bring it with them. You try to plant it, what might this be? And then you watch it grow, you record what you've observed and again, you are becoming researchers and you are becoming engaged. And in our day and age, it's so important too that children remember where their food comes from because so often that's something that they forget. And maybe you could do that. If you live in an, a city area or you have shops nearby, go in and ask your shopkeepers if you can come in and interview them. Better yet, if you can do it in English, but if not, go in and interview them in your local language and ask them, well, where does our food come from? And they may tell you it comes from by ship or it comes by train or it comes by plane or it comes by boat. And you can remember and write down even in your local language, some of the things that you've learned. And then when you come back to your classroom or if you're sitting in an outside area talking about it, you can start to connect the words in your local language to English. Well, he said at the shop that things come by boat. What's the word for boat in English? And, and how can we explore some of that language? And can we try to uh, write or draw something that will help us remember where our food comes from? So that same thing happens when you plant the food. You see it starts from the seed and then when, you, when it grows and you can use the produce, maybe you can find some recipes and make them together. This book, Anywhere Farm, is a wonderful resource for you as well because we can grow things anywhere. So even if you live in the city, you can grow in a pot, you can grow in an old suitcase. And this book is a great resource for you to look at 
to discover where it is that you could plant your own gardens so that you all can be a part of this process, growing things together. Nature is all around us, if only we stop and see. Nature is all around us, a teacher for you and me. You know, I think this is such a catchy tune. Let's try singing it together wherever we are. Here we go. Nature is all around us, if only we stop and see. Nature is all around us, a teacher for you and me. I am going to, I have created a Padlet for you. And so I'm stopping a little bit uh, earlier from this presentation and I'm gonna stop sharing so that I can share that Padlet with you. If you're not familiar with Padlet, it is a, an online shared resource like a, a, a classroom that we can share together. And you just have to click on the link and put in the password. And in there, I've put this PowerPoint from today. I've also put some additional resources for you. And it also becomes a place for us to share. So those of you who are watching today can check into that Padlet. I'm gonna stop sharing now and see if anyone has any questions for me or if you want to sing through any of those songs again so that you can get them into your heads. Let's sing the what do you have in your hand song to see if you can um, get it solidified without even seeing the words in front of you, okay? So, what do you have? What do you have? What do you have in your hand? What do you have? What do you have? What do you have in your hand? I have a leaf. You have a leaf. You have a leaf in your hand. I have a leaf. You have a leaf. You have a leaf in your hand. Excellent. So are there any questions for you? I'm going to send the um, links now that have the um, they have the books and the link to the Dark Sky Association and the poetry walk. And Rebecca has a question. Many teachers get anxious about taking young learners outside because of, because of risk assessments. That is a good question. And how outside can be just outside your door, outside can be outside your classroom as well. And you can also have, when we're thinking about nature as our teacher, maybe we as teachers don't need to take the children outside for them to learn. They all have to come to our school somehow. So if we challenge them to observe things in their own homes or on their own ways, on their own walk to school, if we encourage them to observe things out in nature when they are with their families, perhaps you are in a city and the children go to the shops with their parents. And again, you could say, where do you find things growing when you're out? Outside. If you live in a rural area, you can ask them, what happens when you open your window? Open your window at home and listen really carefully for four minutes and see what you hear. And then when you come back to school, we're going to make a list of all the things that we've heard in our own homes. That's a way that we can also encourage our families and our parents to be a part of the learning process because really, it takes a village to raise a child, doesn't it? And that relationship of us learning from the children and the young learners learning from us and involving the parents and the families, then it becomes a very rich thing. And isn't it great if our young learners can go home and say to their parents, guess what? I learned the name of. So think about that too. How can you integrate the parents in using nature as a teacher for us? Any other questions? Yep, I have shared the Padlet and the password. So you can just uh, click on that link and put in the password. It should work. The password is nature with a small n. I will put those links in here again for you. There you go. 
here's the Padlet on the top, and then you can always get in touch with me as well. Any other questions for you, for me right now? I'm also very curious to know how you use nature in your own work. And do again, use the picture books that I have referred to you. Um, Lauren is asking any ideas for young teens? And that's actually a really great question, Lauren, because the older we get, the more glued we get to our screens as we are all today. Um, so asking young teens, um, I don't know how it is in the different places that you live, but I know that in Norway, many young teens are very engaged in video gaming. And wouldn't it be interesting for them to go outside in nature and find a place in their own community where they could create their own live video game? So if they have a telephone, they could role play their own video game, their own sort of scenario, or they could script it and then write it down and then have some of their classmates then act out this role play that they had written, but in a natural setting because you have all of these props. And as we've heard earlier, asking the why, when, how kinds of questions, having our young teens find a place in your in nature, find a place around your school or in an environment nearby, and then think, how did that get here? Why is it there? And start to ask some questions. And then maybe they have to investigate and ask, they, they have a question about how this street got the name, then they have to do a little research there. So that whole sort of investigative asking questions thing might be a great way to involve your young teens in this kind of activity. Other questions? Thank you very much, Heidi. You're I welcome. think that's all we've got time for. <laughs> all righty. Well, be yeah. in touch. And someone mentioned scavenger hunt, so go ahead. Scavenger hunt and Google <laughs> Earth. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you very much, Heidi. Um, thank you for sharing your wonderful songs and your beautiful singing voice. <laughs> we really enjoyed it. Thank um, you. I, hold on. Let me. I don't